A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John chapter 18 verses 1 to chapter 19 verses 42. Passage taken from the message version of the Bible. The passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Jesus, having prayed this prayer, left with his disciples and crossed over the brook Kidron at a place where there was a garden. He and his disciples entered it. Judas, his betrayer, knew the place because Jesus and his disciples went there often. So Judas led the way to the garden, and the Roman soldiers and police sent by the high priests and Pharisees followed. They arrived there with lanterns and torches and swords. Jesus, knowing by now everything that was coming down on him, went out and met them. He said, "Who are you after?" They answered, "Jesus the Nazarene." He said, "That's me." The soldiers recoiled, totally taken aback. Judas, his betrayer, stood out like a sore thumb. Jesus asked again, "Who are you after?" They answered, "Jesus the Nazarene." I told you, said Jesus, "That's me. I'm the one. So if it's me you're after, let these others go." This validated the words in his prayer. I didn't lose one of those you gave. Just then, Simon Peter, who was carrying a sword, pulled it from its sheath and struck the chief priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Malchus was the servant's name. Jesus ordered Peter, "Put back your sword. Do you think for a minute I'm not going to drink this cup the Father gave me?" Then the Roman soldiers, under their commander, joined by the Jewish police, seized Jesus and tied him up. They took him first to Annas, father-in-law of Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the chief priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it was to their advantage that one man die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. That other disciple was known to the chief priest, and so he went in with Jesus to the chief priest's courtyard. Peter had to stay outside. Then the other disciple went out, spoke to the doorkeeper, and got Peter in. The young woman who was the doorkeeper said to Peter, "Aren't you one of this man's disciples?" He said, "No, I'm not." The servants and police had made a fire because of the cold and were huddled there warming themselves. Peter stood with them trying to get warm. The interrogation. Annas interrogated Jesus regarding his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered, "I've spoken openly in public. I've taught regularly in meeting places in the temple where the Jews all come together. Everything has been out in the open. I've said nothing in secret." So why are you treating me like a conspirator? Question those who have been listening to me. They know well what I have said. My teachings have all been above board. When he said this, one of the policemen there slapped Jesus across the face saying, "How dare you speak to the chief priest like that?" Jesus replied, "If I've said something wrong, prove it. But if I've spoken the plain truth, why this slapping around?" Then Anna sent him, still tied up to the chief priest Caiaphas. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was back at the fire, still trying to get warm. The others there said to him, "Aren't you one of his disciples?" He denied it. "Not me." One of the chief priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, "Didn't I see you in the garden with him?" Again, Peter denied it. Just then, a rooster crowed. The king of the Jews They led Jesus then from Caiaphas to the Roman governor's palace. It was early morning. They themselves didn't enter the palace because they didn't want to be disqualified from eating the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and spoke, "What charge do you bring against this man?" They said, "If he hadn't been doing something evil, do you think we'd be here bothering you?" Pilate said, "You take him. Judge him by your law." The Jews said, "We're not allowed to kill anyone." This would confirm Jesus' word indicating the way he would die. Pilot went back into the palace and called for Jesus. He said, "Are you the king of the Jews?" Jesus answered, "Are you saying this on your own, or did others tell you this about me?" Pilot said, "Do I look like a Jew? Your people and your high priests turned you over to me. What did you do?" "My kingdom," said Jesus, "doesn't consist of what you see around you. If it did, my followers would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But I'm not that kind of king." not the world's kind of king then pilot said so are you a king or not jesus answered you tell me because i am king i was born and entered the world so i could witness to the truth everyone who cares for truth who has any feeling for the truth recognizes my voice pilot said what is truth 
Then he went back out to the Jews and told them, I find nothing wrong in this man. It's your custom that I pardon one prisoner at Passover. Do you want me to pardon the king of the Jews? They shouted back, not this one, but Barabbas. Barabbas was a Jewish freedom fighter. The Thorn Crown of the King, Chapter 19 So Pilate took Jesus and had him whipped. The soldiers, having braided a crown from thorns, set it on his head, threw a purple robe over him, and approached him with, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they greeted him with slaps in the face. Pilate went back out again and said to them, I present him to you, but I want you to know that I do not find him guilty of any crime. Just then, Jesus came out wearing the thorn crown and purple robe. Pilate announced, Here he is, the man. When the high priests and police saw him, they shouted in a frenzy, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate told him, You take him. You crucify him. I find nothing wrong with him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and by that law he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he became even more scared. He went back into the palace and said to Jesus, Where did you come from? Jesus gave no answer. Pilate said, You won't talk? Don't you know that I have the authority to pardon you and the authority to crucify you? Jesus said, You haven't a shred of authority over me except what has been given you from heaven. That's why the one who betrayed me to you has committed a far greater fault. At this, Pilate tried his best to pardon him, but the Jews shouted him down. If you pardon this man, you're no friend of Caesar's. Anyone setting himself up as king defies Caesar. When Pilate heard those words, he led Jesus outside. He sat down at the judgment seat in the area designated Stone Court, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was the preparation day for Passover. The hour was noon. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They shouted back, Kill him! Kill him! Crucify him! Pilate said, I am to crucify your king? The high priests answered, We have no king except Caesar. Pilate caved in to their demand. He turned him over to be crucified. The Crucifixion They took Jesus away. Carrying his cross, Jesus went out to the place called Skull Hill. The name in Hebrew is Golgotha, where they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, Jesus in the middle. Pilate wrote a sign and had it placed on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was right next to the city. It was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. The Jewish high priests objected. Don't write, they said to Pilate, the king of the Jews. Make it. This man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. When they crucified him, the Roman soldiers took his clothes and divided them up four ways, to each soldier a fourth. But the robe was seamless, a single piece of weaving. So they said to each other, let's not tear it up. Let's throw dice to see who gets it. This confirmed the scripture that said, They divided up my clothes among them and threw dice for my coat. The soldiers validated the scriptures. While the soldiers were looking after themselves, Jesus' mother, his aunt, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene stood at the foot of the cross. Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing near her. He said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that moment, the disciple accepted her as his own mother. Jesus, seeing that everything had been completed so that the scripture record might also be complete, then said, I'm thirsty. A jug of sour wine was standing by. Someone put a sponge soaked with the wine on a javelin and lifted it to his mouth. After he took the wine, Jesus said, It's done. Complete. Bowing his head, he offered up his spirit. Then the Jews, since it was the day of Sabbath preparation, and so the bodies wouldn't stay on the crosses over the Sabbath, it was a high holy day that year, petitioned Pilate that their legs be broken to speed death and the bodies taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man crucified with Jesus, and then the other. When they got to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers stabbed him in the side with his spear. Blood and water gushed out. The eyewitness to these things has presented an accurate report. He saw it himself and is telling the truth so that you also will believe. 
These things that happened confirmed the scripture. Not a bone in his body was broken. And the other scripture that reads, they will stare at the one they pierced. After all this, Joseph of Arimathea, he was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he was intimidated by the Jews, petitioned Pilate to take the body of Jesus. Pilate gave permission, so Joseph came and took the body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus at night, came now in broad daylight, carrying a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. They took Jesus' body and, following the Jewish burial custom, wrapped it in linen with the spices. There was a garden near the place he was crucified, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been placed. So, because it was Sabbath preparation for the Jews and the tomb was convenient, they placed Jesus in it. The Gospel of the Lord. Reflections on the Gospel according to John chapter 18 verses 1 to chapter 19 verses 42. On his reflections on Good Friday, Father Ron Rohrheiser had written these beautiful lines. He says, Good Friday was bad long before it was good, at least from outward appearances. How could this be good when God was being crucified? The author of the Gospel expressed it so pregnantly that as Jesus was dying, it grew dark in the middle of the day. As Jesus hung upon the cross, light gave way to darkness, love to hatred, and life to death. How could this day be good? Jesus no longer seemed divine, powerful, and in control of things. He seemed to be sinking into a personal doubt. Other than a few strong women who stood their ground in spite of a hostile crowd jeering at them, everything else was aiding in the crucifixion of Jesus, either out of ignorance, jealousy or weakness. The Good Friday was not good. It showed humanity at its worst before God's seeming silence. Even the angel who strengthened him in Gethsemane seems to disappear when he is on the cross. A crushing dark night of doubt now torments him to the point of making him cry out with what seemingly sounds like despair. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To understand the gravity of this feeling of despair, we must recall Jesus' relationship with his Father. On how many occasions did the Gospel say Jesus went out to a lonely place and prayed? The one who sees me sees the Father, he said. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. I and the Father are one. I have come to do the will of my Father. And as a culmination of this beautiful Father-Son union, he taught us to call Father Abba, Daddy. How would it feel if someone whom you love the most abandons you at a time when you actually need him or her most? In the face of that seeming abandonment, in ultimate darkness, Jesus had to make a choice for faith, love and trust. What does Jesus do? He surrenders to the Father whom he cannot at that moment feel or understand but only trust. Here is where Good Friday turns from bad to good. Jesus surrenders himself not in bitterness, grasping or anger, but in trust, gratitude and forgiveness. In that surrender, Jesus has won the most epic of all battles, the struggle between good and evil. We will rid our world of those powers that perennially crucify God only when each of us, like Jesus, can let our bitterness, grasping and anger give way to trust, gratitude and forgiveness. Like Jesus, we have to surrender ourselves to God, that is, by trusting even when we don't understand, even when we are hated, and by forgiving 
even when we are being hurt. All of us will have our Good Fridays. By every appearance, they will look bad. But if we give ourselves over in trust, they will be good. <laughs>